You know what I was never a big fan of? Ting soaps. I don't want to wait. You know your Dawson's Creeks, One Tree Hills, Pretty Little Liars, Gossip Girls, etc. I'm not sure why, I just never found them really interesting. There have been exceptions to the rule, of course, but overall I just could never get into the highly stylized and melodramatic ways the shows tend to present high school life. And even though my high school years, well, sucked, I'll take the quiet to lonely hours I spent in my room developing depression and a pattern of self-isolation, listening to Evanescence and Linkin Park for days at an end because Amy Lee understands my pain, and pondering if maybe I'm doing it too much in regards to my daily private after-school computer sessions with the rents over the dull love triangles, constant backstabbings, overall white people problems, and alcoholism that these shows often present to the universal high school experience. Let me brood in peace without all that drama, you know. I'm weird. I'm a weirdo. I don't fit in, and I don't want to fit in. However, you know what I really like? Teen soaps with a fantastical twist. Yep, turns out it's a lot easier for me to care about boring cliché adolescent drama written by people in their 30s as long as you add in the element of magic. This probably comes from my love for the sci-fi, fantasy, and horror genres, which has been a preference of mine since way back in my childhood. Power Rangers, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and Goosebumps are probably the most obvious pinpoints as to when and how this started developing. But it wasn't something that was truly cemented as part of my personality until years later, when I got into Buffy the Vampire Slayer. To this day, my favorite show of all times. And probably the most famous and influential series to use demons and other supernatural creatures as metaphors for real-life horrors, especially the horrors of high school during the show's first three seasons. Shop and hang out and go to school and save the world from unspeakable demons. You know, I want to do girly stuff. And even though I'm quickly approaching one decade of not being a teenager, every once in a while, one of these shows still catches my attention for some reason. The most recent one being Netflix's Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, based on the stories and characters from the Archie comics, just like Sabrina the Teenage Witch had been two decades earlier, albeit very, very loosely. The new Sabrina is not a remake of the 90s show, but a darker and more faithful adaptation to the original comics. However, the connection to 90s Sabrina was absolutely the selling point for me, seeing as how I'm one of those depressed, industry-killing millennials who miss the comfort of a time in his life when things seemed happier. So, quick plot summary. The show follows Sabrina Spellman, a half-witch, half-mortal teenager. In season 1, Sabrina's main dilemma is how, or even if, she can balance her life in high school with her mortal friends and her witch studies at the Academy of the Unseen Arts all the while trying to figure out where she fits in this prophecy predicting the return of the Dark Lord, aka Satan. The show fluctuates between extremely graphic and horrifying and comedic hijinks and adolescent drama. It deals with serious real-life issues like misogyny and gender identity while setting up its own supernatural mythology. Like every show from the past 20 years that takes place in Hellmouth High, it borrows a great deal from Buffy, which, yay. But don't get me wrong, the show can be dark and serious, but the biggest enjoyability factor for me is that it's pure camp. And not just any camp, my type of camp. Another thing that grabbed my attention from the beginning is that the show also gives us two queer characters of narrative importance. Theo Putnam, a trans boy whose journey of self-discovery, acceptance and expression is a huge storyline throughout the season, and Ambrose Spellman. Sabrina spends sexual warlock cousin under house arrest due to trying to blow up the Vatican. We also had Luke, Ambrose's warlock boyfriend who also goes to the academy, which is as far as the show went in the whole character development thing with him. Who is Luke? What's his personality like? Eh, he smirks a lot. Appears to be loyal to Father Blackwood, the high priest of the Church of Night as well as the dean of the Academy of Unseen Arts for some reason, and he seems to genuinely care for Ambrose, but we never really get any sense as to what Luke's motivations are, or anything that goes on in his head, really. He's just... kind of there. Occasionally making out with Ambrose... and smirking. Boy, does he love smirking. But, look, the show does feature a supporting cast of millions, so it's understandable that some of them will get less screen time and development as others. It's fine. The show is a really big hit, so they'll just develop him next season, right? As long as they don't... It's about young Lucas. We've lost him, I'm afraid. 
he died in service to the Dark Lord. Ugh. Okay, so a couple of episodes before this, the show tells us in what's basically a throwaway line that Luke was sent somewhere off screen to carry out Father Lockwood's orders. We don't see him at all, and then they inform us that he is dead. Two episodes later, this happens. No! 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 Yep, retreated to every second of Luke's cruel, explicit, agonizing death. So, so, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, you've decided to bury your gaze. Okay, but what is bury your gaze? Well, it's a literary trope. The name is pretty self-explanatory, but basically, it's when a writer inserts a queer character in their texts and then inevitably kills them, along with all of the queer representation in that particular piece of work. Or, alternatively, one includes two queer characters in a relationship with each other, but eventually kills either one or both of them usually after they declare or consummate their love for one another. But of course, there's a lot more history and nuance as to how the strip was developed, the implications it has to the audience, and its continued use to this day. And I think it's a lot more helpful and honest to examine these nuances in order to understand why this is even a thing, and why people, especially queer people, get so frustrated when it keeps on happening. Besides, there's a certain camp that when faced with compliance of the strokes usage, instinctively goes online and starts typing So what? People die in real life. The Reaper knows on sexuality. Are you saying you can ever kill queer people in any narrative whatsoever? What kind of dumb PC social justice warrior bullshit is that? Which, no, that's not what anyone is saying. The key words here are context and execution. So if you're part of that camp, just hear me out. I'm gonna try and explain why people get bothered about the thing. This is a goddamn bitch of an unsatisfactory situation. I think a lot of people tend to think of barrier gays as a purely homophobic trope, and yeah, that's historically true a lot of the times, um, most of the times, but it's not always the case. For instance, you may have heard of a little book by the name The Picture of Dorian Gray, first published in 1890, written by one brilliant young Irishman out of Oxford. His name is Oscar Wilde. Nowadays, Wilde's only published novel is best remembered as one of the great classics of English literature, as well as for being, in literary terms, gay as fuck. Okay, so Dorian Gray follows our titular character a young aristocrat that's described by the narrator and everyone who meets him in the novel as the most beautiful, charming Bay of Bays. One day, while posing for a painting made by his friend, confirmed bachelor Basil Hallward, Dorian meets the nihilistic edgelord Henry Watton, who not only makes him aware of his own beauty and youth in a way that had never really dawned on him before, but also shares his self-indulgent worldviews about how the only way one can truly be fulfilled and the only thing that makes life worth living is to cave in to every impulse that comes their way, with no consideration whatsoever about any society-built ideas of morality or other people's feelings. That's enough to make Dorian get red pilled of something. And in a fit of rage and grief over having just now become really aware of his own mortality, Lolly wishes that he would stay young and beautiful forever while the portrait Basil has finished painting ages and withers with time and the indulgence of his vices instead. If only the picture could change, and I could be always what I am now. For that I would give everything. To which the universe is like, mm, okay. Once Dorian realizes his wish has been fulfilled, he starts living in accordance to Lord Henry's worldview with the deterioration of the picture serving as the visible, physical symbol of the corruption of Dorian's soul. Later in the novel, Dorian kills Basil after revealing his secret to him, and the novel ends with him slashing his portrait and inadvertently killing himself by doing so, with his body taking the corrupted appearance of the picture which reverts itself to its original form. No, one of the vices Dorian indulges in is heavily implied as same-sex intercourse, and all three main characters of the novel are coded as gay or bisexual to varying degrees. This coding happened because being a novel originally published in 1890, there was only so far Oscar Wilde could go in the actual text. In fact, although there's no explicit reference to same-sex intercourse or homosexuality as a concept, the novel's first publication in Lippincott's monthly magazine was heavily edited, without Wilde's knowledge, before the publishers were convinced it could even be printed at all. 
So while I could never have explicitly written that Dorian was out there cruising the streets of London at night, but the original type script of the novel, which wasn't published until 2011, is a lot more overt about that than Living Cut's version, as well as being a lot more forthcoming about Bess's feelings toward Dorian. It is quite true that I have worshipped you with far more romance of feeling than a man should ever give to a friend. Somehow, I had never loved a woman. I suppose I never had time. From the moment I met you, your personality had the most extraordinary influence over me. I quite admit that I adored you madly, extravagantly, absurdly. I was jealous of everyone to whom you spoke. I wanted to have you all to myself. I was only happy when I was with you. One day, I determined to paint a wonderful portrait of you. You was to have been my masterpiece. It is my masterpiece. But as I worked at it, every flaking film of color seemed to me to reveal my secret. There was love in every line and in every touch there was passion. I grew afraid that the world would know of my idolatry. I felt, Dorian, that I had told too much. You must not be angry with me, Dorian, for what I have told you. As I said to Harry once, you were made to be worshipped. Yeah, that was all changed in the revised versions of the novel, but the truth is that there was no way all of the homoerotic subtext in Dorian Gray could be scrubbed off short of giving the basic premise to a different writer to rewrite the whole thing and make it a completely different book. Oscar Wilde was gay, and Dorian Gray was heavily influenced by his life as a gay man in late 19th century England. In the introduction to the original typescript, editor Nicholas Frankel even makes an excellent case for the novel being a lot more autobiographical than I was perfectly aware of, and unfortunately, that ended up being the biggest contributing factor to Wilde's own personal downfall. You see, five years before the picture of Dorian Gray was published, the British Parliament passed the Criminal Law Amendment of 1885. Section 11, also known as the Labouchere Amendment, criminalized gross indecency amongst men, and was used as a legal way to prosecute gay men in cases where sodomy, which was already a crime, could not be proven. So if you were a guy caught so much as kissing another man, or even looking at him lewdly, you could be lawfully arrested and put to prison. In these environments of paranoia, it's no surprise that Oscar Wilde would only go so far as coding the gay elements in the novel and that both the kind, love-stricken Basil, as well as the monstrous, selfish Dorian, had to die. Wilde had to bury his gaze. To do otherwise meant not only disgrace from society, but to face actual prison time. Unfortunately, and perhaps because there's so much of Wilde in the novel, a lot of critics and readers caught on the homoerotic subtext as soon as it got published, some even straight up accusing him of being gay as directly as they could at the time. Which is why Wilde to spend the following months after the novel was released defending it and himself from the backlash, and would later go on to revise a substantial amount of the text for the 1891 edition. However, none of that turned out to be enough. And when Wilde was accused of engaging in so-called gross indecency with another man by the guy's father, the prosecuting lawyer used the picture of Dorian Gray in the trial, claiming that if Dorian engaged in sodomy, then so did the author. Wilde was found guilty, sentenced to two years imprisonment with hard labor, had his health terribly affected, and later died in disgrace, exiled in Paris. We can interpret the picture of Dorian Gray, all of it, as both catharsis and refuge for its author, a way for him to explore and express feelings and ideas that he wasn't allowed to do otherwise. All of the conflict, the sadness, the frustration of being a gay man forced into living a double life in a time and place where society and the law would not allow him to live as his true self. There's also something extremely tragic in how Dorian's and Basil's fate foreshadowed Oscar Wilde's song, and something painfully cruel in how the catharsis and refuge of Wilde's own creation was ultimately used as a tool for his undoing. But knowing all the context and history behind the time when the picture of Dorian Gray was published, helps us see and comprehend that one of the oldest instances of the barrier gay trope came out of a need for protection from an unjust law. And why we're on that... So it turns out Germany also had their own shitty law criminalizing homosexuality. It was called Paragraph 175 and can be traced back to Germany's very first criminal laws back in the 1530s. 
So with that happening in 1919 during the Weimar Republic era, we have what is one of the earliest sympathetic portrayals of gay people in history, the silent film different from the others, partly funded by sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld through his Scientific Humanitarian Committee, which is probably the first LGBT rights organization in history, by the way. The basic plot of this one is that of a violin master called Paul Korner, played by Conrad Witt, one year before he would achieve massive fame for his role as Caesar in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, falling in love and developing a relationship with his fan and later students Kurt Sivers, and being blackmailed by an extortionist who finds out about their involvement. Different from the others was made as a direct protest to paragraph 175, and the movie doesn't tiptoe around that. Magnus Hirschfeld co-wrote the script with director Richard Oswald, with the express purpose of trying to educate people on homosexuality and get 175 repealed. Hirschfeld devoted his life to this ghost, and he even appears in the movie playing pretty much himself to explain to the characters in the movie and the audience that gay people are, you know, people. Not sick, not criminals, just people. This movie came at a time when Germany was experiencing a short-lived period of social liberation, but nonetheless, the movie was, predictably, extremely controversial, and started being protested almost immediately by Christian and right-wing groups under the argument of it being propaganda trying to recruit the German youth into a lifetime of sodomy. As the Nazi party took over about 14 years after the movie's initial release, banning the movie and destroying most prints of it, only a partial, fragmented 15-minute version of the movie remains, with stills and intertitles added in to fill in the gaps, but it's nevertheless well worth checking out. I was honestly shocked to see such blunt, progressive ideas expressed in this film. And also really depressed that 100 years later we're still saying almost the exact same things and fighting for equality, but hey, seeing that as much as things have changed, so much remains the same is the most despairing and sure outcome of studying queer history. Turn down for what? At the end of Different From Others, Coroner is outed by the blackmailer, loses his job, and is shunned by society, eventually committing suicide. So yeah, one of the earliest queer characters in film history ends up dying in the end. Sounds about right. But here's the thing, this doesn't anger me, and I firmly place this in the non-harmful category of barrier gays. The entire project was made with the express purpose of getting mainstream German audiences to sympathize with gay people, and of hopefully overturning a law that criminalized their very existence. The movie ends tragically, yeah, but... Corner suicide doesn't come off as exploitive because the filmmaker's whole intent was meant to show that people were dying and killing themselves because of this law we passed. Let's them do this so we can stop this from happening. Hell, it even states as much in the end, with Hirschfeld's character talking a grieving Kurt out of killing himself and telling him to honor his and all the other lives that had been lost by fighting to repeal this callous law and change society's perceptions of people who are different from the others. Paragraph 175 was only abolished in 1994, by the way. Yeah. So if you're one of the people wondering why we had gay pride but no straight pride, this is reason 523,000 billion. The limit does not exist. Okay, so the first two examples I've shown of barrier gay show the trope being used in a neutral or even positive way. Let's change that. <laughs> Jumping 10 years forward from when Different From The Others was released to the beginning of the Great Depression. Hollywood is facing a problem. Turns out, not a lot of people go out to the movies when they can't even afford such luxuries as food and housing. So in order for the film industry to not die, it has to figure out a way to get those butts into seats. What's the solution for that? Say screw it and do whatever it takes. That manifested itself into making and releasing racier movies that amped up the depictions of violence, sexuality, and even downright taboo topics. That's why you start seeing movies like Freaks, Safe in Hell, The Most Dangerous Game, and arguably even the first wave of Universal's classic monster movies. And you know what? It mostly worked. A lot of movies from that era paid off big, with productions like She Done Him Wrong single-handedly saving entire studios from bankruptcy. But then Hollywood ran into another problem. These movies might be a great way to get audiences to start buying tickets again, but we're still in the early 30s United States, and suddenly there's a big boom of productions depicting everything from adultery, prostitution, divorce, and yes, even alluding to queer identities, the moral gatekeepers of society tend to respond by losing their shit. 
The breaking point seems to be this little biblical epic by Cecil B. DeMille, 1932's The Sign of the Cross, about Christian persecution in Nero's Rome. The nudity, the allusions of homosexuality, the violence, which includes African pygmies fighting Amazon women to the death, all catch the attention of conservative religious groups. The movie frames all of this under the guise of it being pro-Christianity, like Look at the moral decay of these sinners, and isn't it terrible how people treated Christians back then? But it still shows these things anyway. So a year later, in 1933, the Catholic Church creates the Legion of Distancy as a way to lobby studios, boycott movies, and get Hollywood to stop producing such blasphemous, morally corrupt films. Faced with the growing threat of having the federal government to start meddling their business practices, Hollywood decides it's best to take matters into its own hands and develops the production codes as a way of regulating itself. It had actually been written back in 1930, but it wasn't until the executive heads started sweating that the studios began to enforce it. It basically worked like this. Studios would submit everything related to a production. Scripts, wardrobe tests, publicity material, everything out to the final cut. To the code administration which will review everything and tell what were the necessary changes to make it suitable for viewing in accordance to its moral guidelines. Movies that do not receive the close seal of approval would not be shown in theaters owned by the studios. And this was the 30s, so studios owned nearly every single mainstream theater in the country, meaning that anything that tried to ignore the code's moral guidelines would effectively be banned from mainstream viewing. Amongst the code's big no-nos was sex perversion, or any inference to it. That could be interpreted to mean a myriad of things, but as following years would prove, what it truly meant is that no queer people could be shown on film. And it's not like Hollywood was churning out thoughtful, sympathetic, humanizing productions about queer identities before that. Every time queer people appeared on film up until then, it was still in a demeaning or vilifying way. We've talked about this before. But now it was a rule agreed on by the entire Hollywood system that any character or storyline that could be interpreted as queer was officially off limits. Hollywood put a ball gag in its filmmakers that forbade queer people's mere existence to be acknowledged in film at all. But if we've learned anything from Oscar Wilde, is that regardless of how much the system tries to pretend something isn't a part of life, reality finds a way to sip in. Because I just went gay all of a sudden! For better or for worse. So, I hope to talk about the relationship between queer people and horror movies at a later date, and maybe even examine why we love horror movies so much. So I'm not really gonna get into that right now. Stay tuned. I see you shiver with anticipation. However, as it pertains to barrier gaze, we need to talk about code era monster movies. You see, monster movies, especially the old black and white classics, usually show us the monsters being shunned by society, persecuted, and even killed by people who do not understand them, often as a result of a fear-induced mob mentality. What makes it even more tragic is that, in a lot of cases, their monstrousness is caused by forces beyond their control, and we see the very people who once welcomed and loved them destroy them once their sacred nature is revealed. Hmm... Wonder if we can possibly extract a queer reading from that somehow. One of the most in-your-nose examples of queer coding in a monster movie comes in Dracula's Daughter. Countess Maria Zaleska feels and is described as cursed by her condition. She cruises London for victims at night, is drawn to beautiful women, and even seeks for a cure in psychiatry mirroring the present-day idea by the mainstream public that homosexuality was an illness, something that people did instead of something they were, and therefore are possible to be cured, a position that is completely outdated and not one single person believes in or defends anymore. You're in the movie is so not chill with its homoeroticism that part of me is surprised it even exists. I mean, look at it. Why are you looking at me that way? When I do? Yes, you do very well indeed. Of course, Maria is still the villain of the story. A tortured villain, sure, but she's still very much framed as a monster, so of course, she has to die. And that's the problem with all of these films. Equating queer identities with monstrosity, even in stuff like Dracula's Daughter and Frankenstein, where there's an active effort to portray the monsters as at least somewhat sympathetic, 
results in the implication that queer people are monsters and that same-sex activity is the same as an inhuman bloodlust or murderous impulses overall. And if queer people are coded as monsters, considering the way these movies always end, the message one can take out of them is that there is only one way to deal with such abominations. We belong dead. Queerness being equal to villainy was not exclusive to monster movies, or even just a part of the horror genre, of course. In Rebecca, Mrs. Denvers spends the entire film being overly protective of the dead title character's memory, terrorizing her master's new wife, who she sees as trying to replace Rebecca, a woman to whom she has an unusual devotion to, speaking about her as if she was royalty, keeping her room untouched as a loving shrine, and even caressing her underwear. Look, you can see my hand through it. Rebecca herself is a little queer-coded too. She dies before the movie starts, and we never see her, but when her widower, Maxim, confesses that he killed Rebecca to his new wife, who's totally cool with it, by the by, he speaks of her vile nature, which is never truly specified. And the whole speech is framed to get us to feel sorry for him, as if Rebecca having cut this guy somehow justifies the fact he killed her. But you see, it's made doubly okay, because not only was she a dishonorable woman, but it turns out the whole thing was this deeply contrived plan by Rebecca to commit suicide via her husband, because she found out she had cancer and she knew by angering him enough he would strike her, and her head, her head would hit the exact position, the exact heavy object necessary in order to break her skull and kill her. It's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! I tell you, genius! I say. At the end of the movie, Mrs. Denver's goes crazy after learning Maxim was responsible for Rebecca's death and sets fire to the whole mansion. The movie goes out of its way to tell us that everybody got out except for Mrs. Denvers, who is to die by falling burning roof. I find it extremely noteworthy in that in a movie chock full of aggressively unlikable characters, the only one who dies is the coded lesbian. Almost two decades later comes suddenly last summer, adapted from the Tennessee Williams play of the same name who also co-wrote the screenplay. Some people have commented on Williams' somewhat conflicted relationship with his own sexuality and how it translates to his work. But I really don't know enough about him to go into that. I will note, though, that unlike Dracula's daughter and Rebecca, Saturday Last Summer came from the mind of a gay man. And my main reason for including it in this analysis is to show that queer people have had a hand in perpetuating negative tropes about homosexuality, including barrier gays. You see, I bring this up because I can't stress enough that pointing to whatever work of fiction and saying but a queer made it, therefore it can be harmful to queers is a really lame way to defend any work from queer criticism. There is a lot any one marginalized person can gain from siding with their oppressors, and it often happens as a result of a lot of internalized issues as well as opportunism. Suddenly Last Summer also brings up common misconceptions of homosexuality that were really popular at the time presenting its gay character, Sebastian, as a complete mama's boy, which comes from this idea that male homosexuality could be traced back to an overbearing, smothering maternal presence in a boy's life. The plot of this one is that Sebastian's Mrs. Bates' adjacent mother, Violet, is trying to get her niece Catherine lobotomized because she witnessed the circumstances surrounding Sebastian's death, which Violet wants to prevent her from disclosing, seeing as how it was a direct consequence of his gayness and therefore a threat to her son's memory and good name. By the time this movie was released, the production code was already getting a lot less strict, due partially to a new competition brought in by this new technology called television. So we started seeing queer identities being depicted more explicitly, as in, you could be less subtle with their coding, as long as there is some sort of morality tale behind it. Meaning, if you're having queer characters in a movie, it has to be to show how such people are horrible and evil and that you don't condone their sexuality. Which is likely how Saturday the Last Summer was even allowed to be made in the first place. However, they still couldn't say what exactly Sebastian was guilty of, making the scene where Catherine reveals he used her and his mother when she was younger as a way to attract men to himself particularly wonky. What with the scripts having to dance around saying the big H word? Bait for what? What with the better fish? We procured for him. Like Rebecca, Sebastian's face is also never shown on screen, giving him an extra alien aura, further dehumanizing him to the audience. 
The movie is weird in that it fluctuates between being somewhat sympathetic to Sebastian, claiming he was kind and generous, and vilifying him as a sociopath that used people as if they were his toys and thought himself better than everyone else. Not to mention also flat out saying Sebastian's preferences included very young boys, for the obligatory gay men or pedophiles not. The movie ends by revealing Sebastian was killed by a mob of the very same young men he got Catherine to procure for him in Europe. But he wasn't just killed. Oh no. It looked as if... As if they had devoured him! The decision not to give Sebastian a human face, the strange characterization he has, as well as his demise, could all be argued to have been at least partially out of necessity, so the movie would receive the cold seal of approval. But all of these elements were found in Tennessee Williams' original play, with Williams himself saying that cannibalism was a comment on the inherent selfishness of man and how we all devour each other. But the way the chase scene is lifted straight from Bride of Frankenstein and his ultra-violent demise with the very boys he abused, it implies more of a karmic retribution for his crimes thing to me, which adds him to the long line of queer characters being punished for their queerness. Except in this case he was also a pedophile, but it might have been because that's what was widely spread about gay men back then. Or maybe it was a conscious decision by this gay playwright. Look, this move is all over the place. But even if we were to ignore the pedophilia aspect to Sebastian's character, we'd still be left with yet another gay man coded as a monster we have no choice but to kill. And that brings me to something I have to stress out. Queer characters and queer coded characters didn't have to come as monsters analogs or crazy governesses or pedophiles in order for them to get killed at the end. They didn't have to be presented as villains at all. That was just the safest way for the filmmakers to get the cold seal of approval and not be accused of condoning homosexuality by directing any sort of sympathy toward a gay character. But if we look at one of the most classic examples of non-villainous queer coding from this era, Plato in Rebel Without a Cause, we see that it didn't matter if a character was likable or not. It didn't matter if they were a grown adult or a kid. If queerness was implied, that meant they had to be punished at the end, no matter what. <laughs> Which brings us to... In 1961, the production code was amended to allow homosexuality to be openly portrayed on screen as long as it was handled with care, discretion, and restraint. Or, in the words of Vito Russo, like a dirty secret. One of the first productions to come after this amendment was The Children's Hour about two women called Karen and Martha, who run a school for girls and have their reputation destroyed by a student who lies about them being lovers. The movie was based on the Lillian Hellman play of the same name, which had already been adapted to film in 1936 as These Three, where they changed the rumor from lesbians to one of them being in love with the other's fiancé. The Children's Hour is also noteworthy because it might have been the starter point of a long trend of, well, we'll get to that. Anyway, I admit I went into this one expecting to be a bitter hater since I already knew how the story went, but I gotta say, I really did think the movie presented a great study on how rumors and lies can destroy people's lives. And there's a good case to make here about it also being a look at the treatment society gives those who deviate from the very narrow box of whatever is currently considered socially acceptable, although I'm not sure how much of that was intentioned. However, the queer aspect of it still isn't handled very well. You see, Martha eventually realizes that she indeed is in love with Karen, and always has been. And this is how the movie plays it when she confesses her feelings. Oh, it's all my fault! I ruined your life and I ruined my own! Oh, I feel so damn sick and dirty, I can't stand it anymore! Important to note that, by this point, the woman whose granddaughter concocted the rumor Karen and Martha were lovers finds out she had been lying all along. Right after Martha confesses her feelings for Karen, she shows up to beg their forgiveness and say she'll publicly apologize. Karen rightfully tells her to take this attempt at easing her own conscience and shove it all the way out to her throat, but the purpose of this scene is to show that their reputations will soon be restored and there will no longer be social pariahs, which Martha knows because she's standing right there when this all goes down. But even with that knowledge, and even though Karen's reaction to learning about her friend's feelings is one of complete compassion, up to the point Karen says she's still moving out of town, but she wants Martha to go with her, 
Martha is still up and kills herself. Right before Martha confesses her feelings, she and Karen briefly acknowledge the existence of gay people who live their lives without having them be ruined just because they're gay. But this isn't a nuisance, they say. We've done other people haven't been destroyed by it. Which, to a 1961 movie, is really a radical statement. They're the people who believe in it. Who want it. Who've chosen it for themselves. Yeah, it's still referred as a sin and a choice, but... Remember we were coming out from an age where gay people couldn't be openly acknowledged in film at all. So when Martha ends up killing herself, not only does it make no sense given how everything played out, but it takes that statement and completely cheapens it. Martha becomes just yet another pitiful, self-loathing queer person who is so disgusted with herself that she'd rather die than live as a gay woman. Other people are gay and happy, the movie acknowledges. But not Martha. No, Martha isn't allowed that. I honestly feel that in order for this movie to really succeed in the message it was trying to send about the power rumors have to destroy lives, then Martha shouldn't have been gay. By adding that, the movie suddenly shifts themes and ends up being another cautionary tale about how homosexuality will always inevitably end in tragedy, regardless of the movie's brief acknowledgments to the contrary. So yeah, this is one of those very rare instances where I'm of the opinion it would be an improvement to the story not to have any queer characters in it. Six years later, we had The Fox, a Canadian production telling the story of two women, Jill and Ellen, running a farm together. They're having issues with the fox who keeps getting to the hen house and killing their chickens. But overall, even though the farm is not doing too well because women running things, am I right? I'll now take questions. Oh no. My period. Let's nuke England! They seem to be leading happy, quiet lives together. Up until a stranger shows up in their house, starts running things his way, decides he wants to marry Ellen, it's a super creep, and basically disturbs their whole lives. You see, it's a parallel to the fox invading the hen house. He's the fox who invades there. Mm. Anyway, for whatever reason, Ellen, who has been portrayed as the most independent of the two, decides she's into this dude's serial killer creepiness, but even after she accepts his marriage proposal, or um, is forced to accept his marriage proposal, which is okay, because again, she's into him really. She's still split about it because she loves not only her life with Jill, but Jill herself. The movie climaxes after Jill and Ellen confess their love for each other, have sex, and then Ted Bundy here shows up again, and we get the dumbest death in the history of this trope. Jill! Jill! Like, I don't even know what to say. Is this a parody? There's no reason, no reason at all for that to have happened. <laughs> Jesus, death by falling tree. Points for creativity or laziness, I guess. Anyway, the movie ends with Ellen and What's His Nuts living to be together, but at least the filmmakers were self aware enough to not paint this as a happy ending. I know you'll be happy. Will I? We jump forward over 30 years to Willow and Tara in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, one of the first lesbian couples to be featured as part of a primetime American TV show. Will and Tara are also notable for being the healthiest couple in the entire show's history. Like, nobody loses their soul after having sex, nobody leaves anybody at the altar, nobody tries to rape anyone. They're just two women deeply in love with each other. Of course, Buffy having run from the late 90s to the early 2000s meant that the makers of the show weren't allowed to portray their relationship as naturally as they did with all the heterosexual couples. The characters weren't even allowed to kiss up until a season after they started dating. And that's only because Joss Whedon threatened to quit the show if the network didn't let him have that scene. And aside from two allusions that went over the heads of a lot of straight people, it was not until the show changed networks in 2001 that we even got to see that they had a sex life at all. I can feel you inside. I've mentioned the impact Buffy had not just in television, but popular culture overall. However, I didn't really talk about how much of a game changer Will and Tara's relationship was. This did not happen. Characters weren't allowed to be gay and happy and in love, especially not in the main cast of a popular primetime show. The one big exception from that time was, um... Moving on. Over the course of almost three seasons, we saw Will and Tara meet, fall in love, and develop into the relationship that 100% of queer viewers of the show hope to find and experience in real life. I love you guys! 
So you can imagine the outrage when, in late season 6, they did the thing. Your shirt? Tara? Yeah, this was not well received. Season 6 of Buffy is notoriously polarizing. At the beginning of the season, Will and Tara keep fighting because Tara is concerned about Willow's over-reliance on using magic for everything. And they eventually break up after Tara finds out Willow had been erasing their fights from her mind. The episode before Tara dies, though, ends with the two of them reconciling, and they spend the following episode almost entirely in bed, having sex, reconnecting, talking about how much they love each other, making out, and after nearly an entire season of misery, about half of which they spent apart, when the show finally allows this couple to be happy again, BAM! There was an Entertainment Weekly cast reunion a couple of years ago where Alison Hannigan and Amber Benson both reiterated a point everyone involved with the making of that episode has spent the better part of two decades defending. It was never intentional to, to, to be offensive to anybody. It was very much about Willow's addiction storyline mm -hmm. and hitting bottom and being like, she lost the most important person to her. And that was the, the genesis of, of why Tara died. And it wasn't in any way, shape, or form meant to, to hurt anybody. But here is the thing. The Hundred is a CW show that's been airing since 2014, set in the future as a nuclear apocalypse caused whatever remains of mankind to jump ship and live in outer space. It follows the Hundred kids who are sent back to Earth to check out if it's inhabitable again. While they're here, they, including our protagonist Clark, quickly come across the Grounders, a group of hostile apocalypse survivors led by Lexa. As the show goes on, Clark and Lexa grow to respect and like each other, culminating in Lexa kissing Clark in season 2. But seeing as Clark had just recently lost a boyfriend, she was like, you need less speed, get off my case, you gotta slow it down baby, just get out of my face. But the following season, in a quick break from the show's frantic death and violence space, Clark and Lexa finally confess their love for each other. In the moments of happiness, they have sex. Are you noticing a pattern here? And after a little bit of hard eyes and baby will be together forever, BAM! <sighs> yeah, remember that trend I mentioned when we were talking about the children's hour? This is that trend. In case you didn't know, Barry or Gaze only got that name around 2015. Up until then, it was known as Dead Lesbian Syndrome, due to the disproportionate amount of gay and bisexual women that were killed off in movies and television. In the wake of Alexa's death in The Hundred, the enormous backlash by fans was so big and loud that it caught the attention of mainstream media. Marie Lynn Bernard, aka Reese over at Autostraddle, went so far as to do some extensive research and find out that 148 lesbian and bisexual characters had died in American shows by then. A number that, at my time of writing, has risen to 204, as the list keeps getting updated. Heather Hogan, also at Autostraddle, even made an infographic inspired by Reese's research, showing that out of 11% of TV shows that actually featured lesbian bi characters, 35% of them ended in death with only 16% giving a happy ending to their queer women. Jason Rosenberg, the showrunner behind The Hundred, addressed the backlash in a Medium post, saying, The thinking behind having the ultimate tragedy follow the ultimate joy was to hide in the drama and underscore the universal fragility of life. But the end result became something else entirely, the perpetuation of the disturbing barrier gay trope. Despite my reasons, I still write and produce television for the real world, where negative and hurtful tropes exist and I am very sorry for not recognizing this as fully as I should have. Knowing everything I know now, Lexa's death would have played out differently. Rothenberg is allegedly a bit of a dick, but he at least got this one thing right, or pretended to get it so people would stop yelling at him on Twitter. Barrier gaze is not a trope because it happens once in a blue moon. The few examples I presented in this video were chosen among some myriad of options to, hopefully, help any person who's watching this comprehend the strong reaction queer folks have over a type of narrative that's been historically framed as the only possible outcome for non-heterosexual people. When you rarely see yourself represented in the media you consume, and when you do it's often as someone villainous or pitiful or unhappy or dead, seldom as a human being allowed to have a happy ending, that stays with you. You internalize that shit, and honestly, it can fuck you up. The first few times I remember coming across this trope were in a few cold case episodes. The premise of the show, Reopening Investigation of Old Unsolved Cases, pretty much dictates that no matter who's the case of the week, they're gonna end up dead. But it still hit me hard when I spent my first hours with characters that were like me, 
saw them finding a love that was pure and beautiful and real, unlike the fake, dirty and wrong I'd been led to believe, and then seeing them die, leaving their lover behind to grieve for the rest of their lives, in silence, the love that dare not speak its name. Again, the very premise of Cold Case prevented the cases of the week to have a happy ending, but seeing that, especially at a young age, still hurt. Actually, it still hurts seeing queer people die on screen. Honestly, the main reason this episode took so long to produce is that I kept procrastinating the research and having to take long breaks from it because even as an adult approaching it with an analytical lens, it's still hard to sit down and read and watch a bunch of stories where queer people die at the end. It's still something that takes a heavy emotional toll on me. And given how fandom reacts when queer characters are killed off for shock value, by the hands of people who never had to go searching deep for any representation of themselves and then taking a fine comb trying to find within the few options presented to them some representation that didn't end in death. It's very clear that I'm not the only one who feels this way. There's a reason queer people flock to see Lost Simon in theaters and why we get collectively obsessed with stories that surprise us by allowing us to have a happy ending. It's because throughout so much of history, we were not allowed that. So no, it's not about dictating to storytellers that they cannot kill a queer person. It's about telling them, hey, your story does not exist in a vacuum, and perpetuating harmful narrative tropes about a marginalized community who's already at a much higher risk of developing depression and committing suicide due to systematic historical oppression from society is really, really irresponsible. Remember, the key words are context and execution. Nobody got mad when Costas died of AIDS and Poles, and that's not because we were given a pass to the best show to ever happen to, for, and about queer people, don't fight me on this, I am right. It's because it was done with a lot of thought and care put into it. Queer writers, directors, and actors understanding their responsibility and the history behind both the AIDS epidemic and queer people constantly being killed in media, and then treating the subjects and its queer audience with the respect they deserve. Context and Execution it's great that you, the writer, want to add diversity to your story, and nobody's saying you can't do it or you can only do it this one way, but if you're dealing with something outside of your experience, something that does not pertain to you, it might be best to educate yourself as much as possible on the topic, even better if you consult with people who are actually affected by what you're writing about, so you have all the information you need to show those in the audience you're trying to represent that you truly care. Otherwise, all you're going to do, regardless of your intention, is make them feel hurt, angry, and betrayed.